Would you turn to Romans 12, please? We'll continue that um, little short series that we began uh, before the trip to America. Romans 12, we've covered verse 1, so today we'll focus on verse 2. But let us read verse 1 and 2 together since both together um, is one block of, of um, um, message. So let's read starting from verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, <clears throat> by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The Bible has many stories to tell us of men and women who dared to give up all for God. Men who were full of courage and conviction that were willing to pay the ultimate price to be in the will of God. A radical men trampled even over their own self-preservation. And counted themselves nothing but a living holy sacrifice in a pursuit of God. Men like Daniel, who defied the king's decree and continued praying. And he knew that it would cost him his life. And he was thrown in a lion's den. And what about Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego? These audacious and courageous men who were thrown into the fiery furnace. Why? Because they dared to disobey their own government and never to have bowed down to a golden statue. And what about John the Baptist? Another example of a living sacrifice who was willing to pay that premium price for his dedication to God. He rose among his coward peers, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he withstood King Herod's unlawful marriage. He refused to compromise. And when, even when it meant that his head would be served in a platter. And time would fail us to speak of Stephen, who was stoned to death for preaching the gospel Peter, who was crucified upside down, and what about Paul and James and the rest of these godly men, streams of godly men of the past. And all of these men, what they had in common is that they dipped their hearts and minds in this ocean of God's mercies and were motivated to give up their lives for their commitment to Christ. Now, their utmost devotion was not written in the scripture for us to applaud them. No. These examples are such powerful testimony of God's faithfulness to his people, and it ought to inspire us to match their level of commitment and dedication to Christ, no matter the cost. Now, from time to time, I kind of think, to myself, what would I have done if I was in their shoes? What would have we done as a church if once again the government or even our own spouses or family members threaten us? Would we compromise in living out God's will or would we be faithful to the end? Would you deny Jesus like Peter did? Or would you obey him, even if it means your own death? Let me tell you who I believe would deny and who would not. Those that would compartmentalize their hearts. Those that would split their hearts' affections 
between, in one hand, Jesus, and on the other hand, their family, their work, their money. And at the moment of persecution, these kind of people, they will try to wiggle out of their persecution, and they will begin to justify to themselves and they would say, well, my husband threatens to leave me if I obey Jesus or follow him. My wife will divorce me. My children will disown me. Oh, I have to pay a big mortgage. I can't let that happen. I can't follow Christ, at least temporarily. And what they're really saying is that we would rather keep all of these things than to be in the will of God. And if this would be true, then they would have proven to be no more than this rich young ruler that we heard earlier on from Brother Mark, who actually thought that he was a God-fearing man until what happened, until Jesus came along and tested the genuineness of his faith. And it says in Luke 18, 22, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess, distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But he was proven to be a fraud. No more than an eggshell layer of righteousness, but his substance was anything but godliness. We know this story, don't we? Now, I believe it's only fair to say that in the 21st century, somehow the churches of Christ, by and large, let that rich man come into their gatherings and made him feel very welcome and very comfortable. And I'm telling you now that God is sifting through his body worldwide. And this breed of shallow Christianity is challenged like never before. I just heard last week, I'm not sure if you know this, I know some of you do, that Israel has come out with, they introduced a bill that punishes any Christian who would share his faith, whether verbally or write it in his social media. It doesn't matter the medium. He would be punished at least one year imprisonment. Imagine that. Brothers, we don't have to imagine it. You just wait because sooner or later, this bill will trickle its way to down under. God is sifting his church. But let me tell you who will remain faithful. It's those that would embrace the mercies of God to be their own. Those who find Christ to be far more pleasurable than anything in this world. Those who committed their lives to him, once and for all, they would say with the Apostle Paul, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. These are those who will remain faithful to the end. Those who lay hold on to their spiritual vows. Remember those spiritual vows. What are they? We read in verse 1, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. True followers of Jesus are willing to disown even their own selves, give up everything for his sake. No matter the pressure of family or friends, no matter the threats of politicians or police, even if thrown as a breakfast to hungry lions or crucified upside down, your mind is convinced of the infinite worth of Christ and your heart is set on his loveliness. And your will is committed to following him even with the scars of your cross on your shoulders such that even if the closest people to you threaten you to not follow Christ or that will hurt you, you will not bow your knees to anyone but Christ alone. Now let me qualify this. 
And I want to make sure I'm not misunderstood. Because this does not mean that the moment you become a Christian, all of a sudden, those vows will be manifested in your life and somehow you will live in that state of sinless perfection. We're not saying that. No. A Christian is not a man without sin. Oh, no. Those true genuine believers among us, they know that. They know that a Christian is a man who has so many flaws, so many desires, even some habits that are contrary to God. But a Christian is a man who has given himself without any reservation to Christ. That you're no longer your own. But your body and soul, both together, belong to Jesus Christ. And because you have yielded your body to Him, you are committed to modifying the deeds of the flesh. You're willing to crucify the flesh, to fight daily any passions that challenge your devotion and allegiance to Jesus. Well, very well. This is good. We discussed this last time. And if you want to know more about this, please go and download last message. But the question for today is this. How? How? How do I do that? One might say, with all of my heart, I love this calling. But when I take a look at my life, I just don't know. I, I don't know how to live this out. What do I do? Where do I begin? I mean, I'm so encouraged by the mercies of God to embrace this way. I want to commit to this direction of life. It's all great. But there is one thing to pin down your destination in Google Maps. There is another. It's totally different. When you want to know how to arrive there. What is the heavenly map that takes us from where we are and leads us in that direction to reach our destination? How do we live out our supreme devotion to God? And this message will be answering that question. How do we do this? Romans 12 Verse 2, let's read it together again. <clears throat> Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, just to connect verse 1 with verse 2, in verse 1, it calls us to consecrate our bodies once and for all. Spoke about this at length last time. It's only a one thing that you've got. You've got to commit to it once, and for, all, once for all as though it is your wedding vows. But now, in this verse, we are giving two imperative commands, and they are ongoing commands. And they lead us to understand how we can live out what we already consecrated to God. Two commands. One is negative and the other is positive. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. The first is to be shunned. The second is to be done. The first is to be avoided. The second is to be adopted. In other words... If you want to be faithful in your holy marriage to your groom Jesus, if you want to live out your vertical wedding vows, then the first thing is to stop flirting around with the world. And the second is to continue to fill your mind with the truth of God. And what is the end goal? The end goal is this, that your life will be a testimony that what God desires for you, this is where you find the word so that, is ultimately right. It's very satisfying. This is a nutshell what we're going to be talking about, and it will form the three points for our outline. First, 
We're looking to the negative. Second, the positive. And third, the objective. It's got to be three, right? Negative, positive, objective. When we try to, when we understand those three elements, negative, positive, objective, and understand how they're interconnected together, we will know how to live out our dedication to God. Amen? So how do we do that? How do we live out our devotion? First thing is the negative. What is the negative? Do not be conformed to this world. What does this mean? Let's take it one bit at a time. The word world here literally means age. Age. It's the exact word that Paul uses in Galatians 1 4. Let me read it to you. Who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. In many places in the scripture, this word world or age it carries with it the sense of false beliefs the philosophies the methodologies the, the man-made wisdom the strategies of this world sure sometimes this word world actually speaks of the earth as a globe but certainly that's not what paul has in mind he's not commanding you to be conformed to earth He's not commanding you to not be round. Okay? But he's commanding us to not think with the patterns of this world, the thinking patterns, the moral values, the mindset of this world. Don't be influenced by the education or the political system. And we know how wicked education is now whether at schools or universities. Don't be influenced by the media, the ideologies of this world. You know, the, that propaganda of self-esteem, where everybody in the even losing team gets, a, gets a, uh, an award, right? Don't, don't follow this pattern. Not, and certainly don't adopt these unbiblical sayings. Like, you scratch my back, I will scratch yours. Or what's the other one? You fool me once, shame on, on me or shame on you, whatever it is. Don't follow this. Don't follow that. God said countless times, this is evil. And it's true. It has to be evil. Think about it. If man is utterly corrupt, okay? Man is utterly corrupt. And this world that we're talking about is man-made. What else would we expect from God's assessment of that world that is man-made? It's got to be utterly corrupt. And Paul is commanding us not to be conformed to this world. Why is this world utterly corrupt? Let me give you a list of why, based on the scripture. Number one, the intelligent men of this world think they can outsmart God. 1 Corinthians 1.20. Number two, this world deceives even the believers. The world can deceive you. 1 Corinthians 3.18. Number three, this world is ruled by Satan. 1 John 5.19. Number four, this world's clever ideas are foolishness to God. 1 Corinthians 1.21. To no wonder that even John commands us not to what? Not to love the world, nor the things of this world. Don't set your affections on the standards of this world, brothers and sisters. In fact, the Bible commands us not to conform in this world because you don't belong to this world. That you're crucified to the world. That this world is condemned and it's passing away. Well, this is the word world. What about conform? What does it mean to conform to this world? <clears throat> Do not be conformed to this world. This word conform, it speaks of external formation. We need to understand this. It's not internal, it's external. It speaks of compliance to rules and regulations externally outward adaptation, not an internal one. 
So to say, do not be conformed to this world, it means do not externally comply to the evil ideologies of this world. Don't be guided. Don't be deceived by the philosophies, the beliefs, the values of this world. Now, there is one thing that is very interesting that we need to note here. Why is it that Paul is not really commanding us to inwardly change or be conformed? He's saying externally. Why externally, not internally? Very important to understand. You see, because you're born again, so I'm talking here to believers. He has, obviously in the scripture, speaks of believers here, brethren. Those who are born again. Your inner man has already been changed. Right? Your old self was crucified with Christ. We know this in Romans 6 verse 6. Your new self now is the same nature as God. It seeks only after Christ. It hungers for Jesus. Cannot sin. Cannot. Because it's a, you're a new creature in his likeness. So nothing is going to change that. And we ought to be encouraged by this. If you're born again, no matter how much you succumb to the evil standard of this world, it will not alter or change or ruin the inner heart of yours. It's only external. Otherwise, if it was going to change your inner heart, guess what's going to happen? What God has to do. He has to give you a new heart again and again. But God doesn't do that. He only gives you a new heart once. So it's only an external conformity. And so what Paul is saying here is don't try to be someone that you're really not. That's what he's saying. Brethren, by the mercies of God, don't try to be someone externally that you're not internally. When God redeemed you and changed your heart and given you a new spirit, his spirit within you, you have become a new creature. All things have passed away, right? New things have now come. And so when you hug the world with your arms out wide, you are trying to be externally with something that is not consistent with God is doing internally in you. And Paul is saying, don't do that. Don't. It's not going to help you to be devoted to God. Now, while we're still in that point, let's break it down even further. That command. The command has the word be. Do not be conformed. In other words, you're not, you're not doing it yourself. You're not doing the, the conforming. It, in other words, it's not saying don't conform. That's not what it's saying. It's saying don't be. In other words, you're being pressured from something outside of you. And Paul is saying don't let that happen. Don't let that happen to you. In other words, the world wants to control you. It wants to lure those that belong to Christ to be shaped by its thoughts. And you must resist it. Pressure. Peer pressure. Media. Education system, the clothes we wear, the list is endless, brothers and sisters. We know this. And by the way, it is not subtle anymore in the world that we live in, right? All you need is five minutes watching a TV before your, your eyes get assaulted by some sexual perverted scene. Another thing that we need to note here, Paul is not saying don't sin. If you want to say, don't sin, he would have said that. But no, to, not, to, to be conformed to this world is not necessarily a sin issue. This is another thing that we need to understand as Christians who want to be devoted to God. Conforming to the world is not equal to only sinning. No, it's more than that. It's anything that is not going to help you to live out this holy, living, sacrifice kind of way. 
What does that mean? I'm a little confused. Can you give me some examples, please? Well, I would love to. It's my pleasure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three examples. We're a small, loving church, and I'm sure you will put your guts down, and you will help me to speak into your life to help us, to all, all of us, to grow. So please, let's hear some, some tough truth. All right? Again, they're not sin issues. They may not necessarily be sin issues, but the question is not whether they're sin or not. The question is, are they going to help me to live out a holy life before God? Okay? One example is materialism. Materialism. It's the lie of this evil world that says to have better and bigger stuff of this world, it will make me happy. So materialism is. So what happens when believers conform to this world? Rather than being content with a small shelter, many devote their energy to get a bigger and better stuff, leaving only crumbs of their time to parent their children, and they neglect their wives. Men. Is hard working good and godly? Absolutely, right? For sure. We must not be lazy. But if we work longer hours and much harder just to get a better car or renovate our homes at the expense of fathering, fathering our children to raise our children in the fear of God, how? Are we living out our devotion to God? We're not. And you know something? When we all appear before God, before the judgment seat of Christ, God will not question us whether we had a better lifestyle. He will not even question us whether we have sent our kids to better schools. No. You know what is going to question us? How faithful were we in fathering our children? If we were found faithful, that's all that matters. We'll be happy in God forever. And that's all that matters. Don't believe. Don't believe that live materialism. Another example of conforming to the world. <clears throat> you okay to take another punch? In a loving way. I'm just being loving to you. Fashion. What about fashion? The world pressures us to keep up with the latest designs. Right? Have we given to this lie? Now, let's qualify it. There is nothing wrong with wearing the clothes of this culture in principle. Okay? So please don't go and buy... Uh, first century garment and walk around thinking that you're godly, you know, being godly, you're being weed, okay? So we're not talking about that and say, ah, oh, Pastor West said this, all right? No, I'm not saying that. However, if we go and buy clothes that are sensual and entices men and women to sin in their hearts, clothes that would take the shape of the curves of the body in such a way that if the clothes were the same as the skin color, someone might actually accidentally think that person is not wearing anything at all. Tight clothes, clothes that are so revealing. And if asked the question, how come you're wearing this kind of clothes? Well, it's the fashion. It's the trend. It's cool. Well, who said it's cool? Now, this evil world. And what the world says it's cool. Most likely, God would say it's sensual, provocative, it's carnal. And we've got to make sure that we're not giving into this lie. All right, third one. Third one. Violent games. Violent games. You know, we play gaming. I'm not going to say this because we have young men and 
they're growing and parents, we need to watch out for this. Well, what do I mean by violent games? You know, some dude that goes around with a machine gun killing people and blood spilling out. It's, you know, these kind of violent games, especially in these days where the technology makes it um, so, as though it's so real, right? It places the, the gamer in a position, an environment where you would think it's a real world. And they get this rush when they kill people and they think it's fun. And we understand that the world believes it's only fun and it, and it sells it as fun. But as Christians, what do we think about that? Do we really think that playing violent games, especially for a long time, it won't affect us or affect our children? Have we given to such kind of violent games? Can we really play violent games and yet the Ten Commandments clearly prohibit us from, from murdering anyone and, and say that we're, we, are being, we are not being conformed to this world? Please think about it. Because I did. I did for a long time. I had someone that said to me, after I challenged him, he said, well, when I play violent games, I'm not literally going around killing people. It's only virtual. I don't do it in real life. Only virtual. Stay with me. How about we try that with committing adultery? Right? Ten Commandments says you shall not commit adultery, right? How about we make a game where the aim of the game is if the more ladies, women that you sleep with, the more score you get. Would you play this game? How about the other command that says you shall honor your parents? How about if the world makes up a game and the goal of the game is the more stones you throw at your parents virtually, the more scores you get? And if we say, well, no, we shouldn't be doing A and B, well, why should we do C? What's the difference? What God commands us in the Ten Commandments, we must keep in our hearts. And if they are kept in our hearts, I trust me in that one, we will keep them both in the real life and in the virtual life. Our life must be consistent. Now, again, I need to qualify, my, qualify myself. These are not sin issues as per se. I'm not saying that they are sin issues, but that is the whole point of what not conforming to the world means. It's those things that are acceptable by the world, yet raise deep concern by those who want to present their bodies as a living holy sacrifice to God. The world's values and goals are polar opposite from our growth in holiness. They stunt our growth. And Paul commands us saying, don't do that. We must not allow the world to pressure us in any way that would cause us to comply. Let me give you a quote by J.C. Ryle. It just perfectly summarizes what we're saying here. J.C. Ryle says this. The ways, the fashions, and amusements and recreations of the world have a continually decreasing place in the heart of a growing Christian. He doesn't condemn them as downright sinful, nor say that those who have anything to do with them are going to hell. We're not saying that. We're not saying if you have this as a pattern in life, you're not a Christian. We're not saying that at all. He only feels they have a constantly diminishing hold on his own affections and gradually seem smaller and more trifling in his eyes. Very well. Let's just wrap that point up. Brothers, if we want to live out our supreme devotion to God, there has to be people that we cut off from our social life, places that we should not go to, internet sites that we don't, we don't open. If we want to be found faithful to the end and not lose our first love to Christ, there must be games that we do not play. 
precious time that we do not waste, clothes that we do not wear. There must be movies that we do not watch, money that we do not throw away. We must live as though this world is not our home. That's the negative. The positive. But be transformed. Rather than to look like the world, to have fun like the world, to dress up, like the world, or to laugh at the dirty jokes of the world. Rather than all that, a believer is to be dedicated to God. He's to be transformed. So again, yes, we're constantly bombarded by the world, and we've got to reject it, absolutely. But that's not enough. To say no to the world is not enough to create a long-lasting change in our devotion to God. Brothers, we know this, that no team has ever won any game by only playing defensively. You've got to be on the offense, right? We've got to be transformed. What does it mean? This word transform, it has to do with a change. Transform from one form to another. Metamorphosis is the Greek word. It's uh, meta meaning uh, um, nature, morphosis meaning change. It's like the transformation for, of a caterpillar to a butterfly. Or even more specifically in the New Testament, it has to do with a change, a transformation from something that is simple to something far more magnificent, like Jesus when he appeared before the disciples, right? And he's inner essence radiated and his appearance became like a, a blazing sun from something simple to something far more glorious. Stay with me. Metamorphosis is used another time in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Let me read it to you. But we all with unveiled face Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Just as from the Lord the Spirit. Transformation means everything about you changes. Your character, your speech, your desire. Now it's very important to pay attention to the way God rendered this command. We're going to break it down again. So stay with me. You can even read it with me if you like. Number one, please note it is in the present tense. What does that mean? It means that you've got to continue to be changed. This transformation is not on, off. It's always constant, never stops changing. You're always, there's always room to grow. Second, it's passive voice. Continue to be changed. Paul doesn't say, transform yourselves. You can't do it, even if you wanted to. That change has got to be done by something or someone else out apart from you. Who is it that does a transformation? That verse that we read earlier, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. It's the Spirit that does the transformation. Okay? Well, one might say, well, oh, that's good. It's the Spirit that does the change, not me. So all I need to do is just sit back, relax, and let the Spirit do His work. No. No, no, no. It is imperative mode to the second person, that is you. In other words, you must continue to be changed. So believers are not meant to be passive in this process. Okay? Our accountability to change is not cancelled because it's the Holy Spirit that doesn't work. No. Right? Are you with me? We can't sit still and... See, like eggplants on the couch and watch the moon moving 
and think that somehow we're going to be changed. The responsibility lies squarely with us. Well, what does that mean? Who does a change? Is it me or is it the Holy Spirit? Don't confuse. No, 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 no. There's nothing confusing about this. Why? Well, you see, what this basically means is that we have got to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us. How do we do that? Paul continues on and he says, by the renewing of your mind. Your mind is the faculty of thinking. It's the CPU. Right? It always sticks. It never stops sticking. You're always thinking. If you stop thinking, what happens to you? You die. Okay? You're always thinking. And what Paul is saying here is that you've got to consistently, deliberately expose your intellect. Expose it to what? Well, when you join the other verse that we read, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we'll get a better idea. It says, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Beholding in a mirror, you can easily replace that with the renewing of the mind, renewing it or exposing it to what? The glory of the Lord. To renew your mind is to expose your mind to the Lord, to the glory of Christ. So let me explain it to you. What Paul is saying here is that when you commit your mind to the glory of Christ, the Spirit will transform your heart. This is how we'll be transformed. The only way that you can, and the only way that you can behold the glory of Christ is how? By reading about Him. Reading about Him. Search Him. Search for Him in the Scripture. Discover the gentleness of Christ and be amazed about it. Find out what makes Him a move with compassion or how, why does He respond with anger. Let your Christ simmer with Christ. And then, the Spirit will transform you. Do not be conformed to this world, but meditate on the living word through the written word. What's the point of all of this? What's the end? So what? So that you may prove what the will of God is. Negative, positive, and now the objective, so that you may prove what the will of God is. God doesn't call us to live aimlessly, right? We understand this. Unbelievers, that's their way of thinking. They're born, they live, and while they're living, they suffer, and then they die, and that's the end of it. And so they say that while we're alive, we'll make the best out of this world. And they follow the lustful desires. Wherever the wind blows, they just go with the wave. But those who have surrendered their lives to God, they have a clear mission. And it is such a, a satisfying mission. To prove that the will of God is. That's the whole point. This is it. The reason why you do not conform to the world. The reason why you are, you are to be transformed. It is so that you prove what the will of God is. Now what does this mean? What does it mean? To prove so that you would prove what the will of God is. Is it that, ah, oh, I don't know what God's will is. So what I have to do is I have to uh, not be conformed. I have to be transformed. And when I do these two, therefore, I will be confident what God's will is. No, that's not what it means. That's not what it's saying. Brothers, if you want to know what God's will is for sure, do you know what you need to do? Just read the Bible. You're right. Just read the Word. So that's not what it's saying. Now, when I looked at it carefully, I don't want to bore you with the Greek and literary and, and all the rest of it. Basically, what this means is that when you devote yourselves to God, you will discover that God's will is in fact, continue reading, good. 
you will experience that the will of God is acceptable and is perfect. Let me explain. The natural man, the carnal man, how does he view the will of God? He hates the will of God, right? He can't stand it. He feels that God's will is against him all the time. A man in his flesh feels like Jesus' yoke is heavy. Right? It's difficult to live godly. And so they grumble and complain when they're doing the will of God. Yeah? And I'm sure you heard this before said. I'm sure you heard it said once before. Why do we have to fellowship with one another and talk about God? What is the point of loving the brethren sacrificially? Why do we have to gather very often and pray and read the word? It's too much to be. I can't have this. That's too much for me. What Paul is saying here is that when believers say no to the world, no to the pressure and the lies of the world, and yes to beholding Christ, what will that do? It will remove the scales off their eyes. The eyes of their minds. And then they'll begin to obey God from their heart. And as they obey God's will, they will discover it's good. It's good. It's acceptable. It's perfect. You'll experience the delight, the joy in submitting to the will of God. Let's take it one bit at a time. You will realize that God's will is good. It means it will help you to grow morally, spiritually. And you will say, it's right for me. It's best for me. And not only that, it's acceptable. Meaning it will be pleasant. It is delightful. And more than just delightful, it's perfect you will experience that there is absolutely nothing in the universe that comes close than to be in the center of God's will. That's what Paul is saying. All right. This is good. I'm going to try to condense that message because I know there's a lot to keep in mind. Well, I want to come to the end. So I'm going to skip a few things. Because I believe the end is very important for us to take home. So I need your minds to be wide open. Just pay attention. Because I want to finish with a question. And the question is this. What is the connection? Why is Paul saying that if we ever want to enjoy the will of God. That we must not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. What's the connection between these three? The negative objective and the, uh, sorry, negative, positive and the objective. Or in another way of saying it, recall what I mentioned in my introduction. How did the men of old stand strong before bloodthirsty kings and rulers. How was it that they were faithful to the end? Why is it that Joseph never grumbled and complained? Daniel never whinged. Why is that? There's something fundamental that we need to understand. I believe Brother Young spoke of it last time. We must understand that we are hardwired to be pleasure seekers. That's who we are. That's how God hardwired us. Now, when we understand that we are pleasure seekers, things will then begin to make sense. So I'm going to go back to these three examples that I gave earlier. Materialism, um, clothing or fashion, and gaming. I want to put things into perspective to help you understand how to apply this in your life. 
Let's say materialism, for example. What does that mean? It means that the world is luring us to have more money. Okay? And it's appealing to some pleasure in us. Perhaps it's the pleasure of feeling secure. Do you want to feel secure? You've got to have more stuff. Now, try to obey God's will while your pleasure of security is constantly being fed by materialism. You can't, right? You can't do this. Your pleasure of insecurity will never let you. So what do you do? How would you enjoy being in the center of God's will? You can't just stop being conformed to the world and ignore that pleasure of security in, in you. You can't do that. You have to seek the pleasure of finding your security in Christ. Being transformed. Are you with me? If you're not with me, nod your head this way. If you're with me, nod this. All right, so we're all with me. David says in Psalm 18, verse 1, I love you, O Yahweh. Please notice how he finds his security, the pleasure of security in Yahweh. He says, I love you, O Yahweh, my strength. Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Brothers and sisters, you too, you've got to find your pleasure of security where? In Christ. When you sense that your vulnerable sheep fix your eyes of your mind upon Jesus as your good shepherd. Know that he rejoices over the fact that he loves to protect you. When Satan reminds you of your sins and guilt and you feel insecure, meditate on Jesus' wounds as your hiding place. Renew your mind by re remembering his faithfulness to you. Scripture tells us when you're afflicted, confused, Persecuted, Jesus will never let you be crushed, give up, or destroyed. And most of all, he will never forsake you. No situation at any time that you're ever alone. Find the pleasure of security in Christ. Be transformed. What about fashion? Perhaps. Perhaps you sucked into this trend of this world because you're seeking the pleasure of pride. Oh, when I wear these kind of clothes, people will look at me and praise me and exalt me. And so wearing the clothes of the world feeds your pleasure of pride. So what do you do? What do you do? You can't just stop at not wearing ungodly clothes, again, your pleasure of pride will not let you. So what do you do? Be transformed. What do I mean by that? You must seek the pleasure of exalting Christ. Behold Him high and lifted up. Delight in the fact that Jesus is above all, over all, and everything is beneath Him. Arouse your pleasure of exalting Jesus. Know that thousands upon thousands of mighty warriors will cast their crowns at his feet. That myriads of myriads of angels surrounding his thrones flapping their wings. And as it says in Revelation 5.11, crying aloud with a loud voice. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, on and on. What does that mean? Sever your pleasure of pride by seeking the pleasure of exalting Christ. You want to be true to the word, not be conformed, but be transformed biblically? You sever your worldly pleasure by seeking that pleasure in Christ. Violent games. 
Perhaps you may struggle with the pleasure of control or vengeance, whatever. I'm just giving examples here. You might think of others yourself. And what do you have to do? You've got to seek that pleasure of Christ as the awesome, true judge of the earth. Open your heart to this truth. Study the word. Travel to the end of time and see Christ arrayed in his splendid glory. When he comes back and he splits the sky wide open, bolting out of the the heaven on his white horse, slaughtering his own enemies, judging the world, sitting in his majestic throne, delight in his fact. Delight in in that reality that is to come, that he will reign in Davidic throne for 1,000 years and the whole entire world will come bowing down and worshipping him and adore him for that. Sever worldly pleasure by seeking that pleasure in Christ. And what Paul commands... The Romans 2,000 years ago, God today commends us here. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Be transformed. Let your soul be like a, a hungry lion and all of Christ like food. Devour him. He loves that. Only then, brothers and sisters, would we be able to join shoulder to shoulder with those faithful men of the past, Daniel, Joseph, Paul, Peter, who for Christ's sake threw their bodies in the the very mouth of persecution, fearing no loss of possession, gladly suffering shame for Christ. Oh, the powerful pleasure Of knowing Christ Jesus. Amen, brothers? Seek to find your pleasure met in Christ. And you will never regret it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It may be a heavy subject. It may be lengthy. But Lord, would you please grant us to embrace the truth from your word. Help us to see Christ in all of his glory. And to commit and to say, I will follow Christ. I will seek pleasure found in Christ, not in the world. Grant your people the power to sever any worldly Pleasures that are contrary to your will. May Christ be magnified in his bride. In Jesus' name, amen.